Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, tonight marks the start of Channel 4's Fake News Week. Every night, we'll be looking at the phenomenon and how it's challenging our perceptions of the world around us. Donald Trump began his day with a tweet dismissing as fake news polls that suggested public dissatisfaction with his migrant ban. But despite his ready use of the label for pretty much anything he dislikes, Trump was seen by some as benefiting from made-up stories during the presidential election campaign. In a moment, we'll be looking at fake news on this side of the Atlantic. But first, our Washington correspondent, Kylie Morris, reports on Trump's relationship with the media and US attitudes to truth, lies and the grey areas in between. By the president's latest definition, fake news is not so much organised disinformation, more anything the media says that doesn't reflect him in all his glory. Only this morning he took to Twitter to invite followers to dismiss any unpleasant truths. Any negative polls are fake news, just like the CNN, ABC, NBC polls in the election. I call my own shots, largely based on an accumulation of data and everyone knows it. But what data? In the case of his voter fraud claims, President Trump took up a tweet popular with conspiracy theory websites and ran with it without hard evidence that it ever happened. So you think you're going to be proven correct in that statement? Well, I think I already have. A lot of people have come out and said that I am Yeah, correct. but the data has to show that three million illegals Look, voted. Forget that. Forget all of that. It is the new normal that when the White House is cornered over a lie, it recasts what truth is. Why did he do that? It undermines the credibility. Here's of a the memorable exchange with Kellyanne Conway debating crowd sizes at the inauguration. You're saying it's a falsehood, and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. Call me old fashioned, but I still believe there's something as a verifiable fact and truth and I don't believe in what Kellyanne Conway has called alternate facts because that's straight out of George Orwell. <laughs> there are Orwellian moments on offer every day from this White House. Ask a question in the Oval Office about new Iran sanctions and you'll need to leave. They're not behaving. Thank you guys. Non-compliance will not be tolerated. Good morning. So many issues. In the democratic rough and tumble of America, the free press once had high standing, but Donald Trump declared war. At his only press conference since the election, he harangued outlets who challenged him. Since you're attacking us, can you give us a question? On that day, it was CNN. Mr. President elect, attacking no, our news not organization, you. Not can you. you give us a chance? Your organization. You are attacking us elect. Go ahead. Can you say she's asking a question. Mr. President elect, can you Don't be can you give us a question? I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You can you stay categorical? You are fake news, sir. That nobody, it's no, Trump's no, staff like you can hear topic. applauding, by the way. In truth, there was nothing fake about the story that had angered Mr. Trump, but in his battle with the so called mainstream media, it's the fight, not who's right, that matters. Trump made us part of his act. You know, he would point to us during, during his speeches and say, look at those bloodsuckers, look at, look at them, you know, they're, you know, they're not on your side, I'm on your side. And that was very successful. To make it perfectly clear, in a recent interview with Christian Broadcasting, the president painted it in the simplest of terms. Yeah, I think the media is the opposition party in many ways. The dishonesty, the total deceit and deception. But the president can only undermine the media effectively because so many Americans already distrust it. I was just reviewing a survey. Uh, they asked a thousand Americans what they thought was most threatening to the electoral system. One of the options was Russia, and they still chose the mainstream media as the biggest threat to the electoral system. Conservative commentator Molly Hemingway says we can at least, in part, be blamed for our own undoing. People really feel like the media have been playing partisan politics for too long, not trying to understand the, the whole diversity of the country, being overtly and unnecessarily hostile to a lot of conservatives. And so this is the culmination of a really long period of a breakdown in trust. You know, I don't really buy that line of thought. Back at the august Washington Post, Margaret Sullivan defends the media's record against allegations of bias. You know, all the coverage of Syria, I think, was, was very critical of Obama and, and more. But there is a blind spot she concedes in its coverage of middle America. I think where you can certainly fault 
the mainstream press in America is in failing to understand how important the center of the country was to the outcome of the election. That, as you know, I have a running war with the media. They are among the most dishonest human beings on earth. They like the fact that he's lying his way to the presidency. They like the fact that he's conning us and, and that we're horrified by it. All of that gives, gives them his voters tremendous pleasure. Perverse pleasure for his supporters and a critical tool for this president undermining those in the truth business to author a reality he prefers. Kylie Morris in the United States. Well, now here, a survey for Channel 4 has found that only 4% of respondents shown three true and three fake headlines could actually accurately differentiate them at all. So some Britain... So does Britain face the same dangers from the trend? And are we bothered if we do? Our Home Affairs correspondent, Andy Davis, has had a first look at the results. In the political maelstrom of a US election, fake news tapped its richest scene yet. The epidemic of malicious fake news and false propaganda. Uh, disinformation, fake news. This, this is something that has constantly been disproved. But this isn't true. This isn't right. Clinton branded a pedophile and the Pope endorsing Trump. They were made up stories shared millions of times. But from Washington to Westminster, politicians are spooked. This is the right. Maybe England rugby players too. There are quite a lot of fake news stories operating on Facebook that A have died. Random reality bending or downright democracy threatening. There's no getting away from it. I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You can you, you are fake news. Fake news is big news. This is a lie. What do we mean by the phrase fake news? deliberately false stories manufactured to fool you, well, we can all agree on that one. But what about those satirical spoof news websites? Or real event news reports which clearly pander to an agenda? Is that fake news too? From a few drinking dens in Bristol, we invited some definitions. What do you understand by fake news? Me Propaganda. Well, it's thing, yeah, it's uh, me media spin as well. Like, it might have some truth to it, but like maybe a word of truth, but not the whole truth. When I say fake news, what, what comes to mind? Today, clickbait. 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 Dodgy news stories, print and broadcast, aren't exactly new. It's just their breeding ground has got a whole load bigger. People on their way to work filled up the travelling time in the good old way by reading all about it. The old order of news looks increasingly quaint in an age of social media. For young people now, their main source of news or click it, and that would be like, <laughs> it's really bad, but it's, on, it's like, honestly the truth. news? But in the vast world of news, how easy is it to spot a fake? In a YouGov survey for Channel 4, 1,600 people were shown six headlines, three true, three fake. Just 4% correctly identified all three true stories and all three fake stories. Half thought at least one of the fake stories they were shown was true. Question number eight. This is Scotland's largest island. We tried out some of the headlines in Bristol. Pub quizzes first. Uh, Trump offering free one-way tickets to Africa and Mexico for those who want to leave America. Yeah, probably true. <laughs> he probably would do that. Yeah, probably. That's very Trumpy, isn't that? Yeah. Iceland to host New Year's Eve party for asylum seekers. What do you think? I think that's fake news. I think it's fake news. I think it's true. I'm going to say true. Mm. I'm going to say true as well. I it's just okay. can't tell. Half of those surveyed said they were worried about the effects of fake news. And that number was even higher among the under-25s. Are you worried by fake news? No, not at all. Why not? Because people have a duty to research their own information. I think it's very pernicious, actually. And it's fake and it's not doing the media any good whatsoever because it just makes them even more suspicious. If you suspect a news story is fake, you can report it. Facebook and Google are now looking at new ways to filter out or flag up fake news. But asked if Facebook and other social media sites like Twitter are doing enough to tackle fake news, two-thirds of those surveyed said they aren't. The majority also wanted the government to do more. Most of our interviewees in Bristol 
favoured more independent fact-checking. I don't know if there's a role for the government, but I feel like there could be um, some outside body that could perhaps um, sort of put their stamp of approval. If on Facebook you could just say, flag it, I don't think it's real, and someone could look into it, it's, you know, another way of ca like catching all this news before it's getting to everyone. I don't see how anybody can police it. Uh, if you're going to police it, then you have to police free speech. And how do you police freedom of speech? So what do you do about it then? educate people. we just got to learn to be more sensible when listening to gossip. <laughs> Sound advice indeed, but in this so-called post-truth world, the task of sifting gospel from gossip isn't always quite as black and white as we'd like. How each of us decides I've never been sure well, with me now is the journalist Ella Whelan. She's the assistant editor at Spiked. From Westminster, we're joined by the Conservative MP Damien Collins, who's chair of the Select Committee, which has launched an inquiry into fake news. From Toronto, we have BuzzFeed's media editor Craig Silverman. And from Phoenix, Arizona, Paul Horner, who writes what he calls satire or hoax stories. His pieces were widely shared online in the run-up to the election. Paul Horner, um, let me begin with you. Um, could you raise your hand and promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, yeah. and nothing but the truth in this interview? Um, why, why do you do it? Hail, hail Satan. <laughs> why, do, why do you do it, Hello? Paul Horner? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh. Yeah. Can I first just start by saying that Donald Trump is a, an idiot and his supporters are morons? Well, and anyone who follows his stuff and believes anything he says is an idiot, they've shared my news as fact, tweeted it, shared it so many times. Like, everything they do is fake news. He is fake news, and he started this whole evil fake news thing. My stories, I've been doing this six years, everything that's always been like pranks, hoaxes, satire, shenanigans, always gotten praise i've always had fans ever since november 17th like since this whole fake news thing started this evil fake news thing started um suddenly i'm satan and people have harassed me and i'll ask them what article are you even talking about they don't even know my work i just get lumped in with all these fake news like uh outlets that need to go there's so many hustlers.com like i could name so many that just do fake news yeah. to be fake news to get ad revenue um but you did do, do, do stories do didn't you purpose, the, everything is satire you, you did stories during the election What's campaign that? that got shared by trump supporters didn't yeah. you so a lot of people would assume you were doing that yeah because you believed in trump now you've just made clear that you you clearly don't um, so were you just doing it for the money or for the celebrity or, you know, what motivates you? Every story I wrote mocked Trump. Every story made them look like idiots. The only stories that, like the people that were sharing it, uh, I was trying to get people not to vote for Trump, um, which I know I did a good job of doing, but I think the people that were continuing to share my stuff, even when I would put giant headlines on my stories like, this is not real it would still get shared by the alt-right, um, the conservatives, uh, Bible thumpers, um, people that don't fact check. Um, something that actually I did an interview this morning with uh, 780 AM, it's a major uh, radio station here in the, the Valley in Phoenix, up in Flagstaff also. They said, and I quote, Paul Horner has done a great service to the world by shedding light to the need for fact checking in bringing light to fake news. Okay. So, um, let me go to Craig I Silverman. I've never even thought. I never even thought of it that way. But Craig Silverman, what what has been the effect? Do you think of these sorts of stories? I mean, do you have any evidence that they changed anything? That people were sharing them because they believed them? Well, I, I think there is a lot of evidence accumulated over the years from research that people do tend to want to react strongly to information that confirms what they believe. So it's probably safe to assume that folks who are, who are already inclined to like Trump or who didn't like Clinton might be more inclined to share and to read stories that portray him in a positive light and her in a negative light. 
Um, I think one of the things that people have been claiming that there's really no support for is that, you know, fake news got Donald Trump elected. I think it certainly has had an effect on, you know, the public debate, and it continues to spread now. Uh, but in terms of changing people's minds and telling them how to vote, I think that that's probably a, a step or two far in terms of trying to get a sense of the impact it had. Now, the thing is, we started off thinking of fake news as new, you know, news stories that were deliberately made up that were not true. Now, Trump has tried to own the phrase fake news and redefine it as news that is either mistaken or later shown not to be quite true or just news he doesn't like. Um, so, so, you know, how do you own what the phrase really means? Well, I think, to be honest, it's kind of a remarkable thing that in the span of, what, say, three months, it's gone from meaning a relatively specific thing, as you said, a, a completely fake story created to fool people, usually for financial motive. And today the term has, is almost meaningless. It's gone from something that nobody had heard about you know, four or five months ago to something lots of people have heard about, but nobody really knows what it means. And I, and I do think Trump has been in some ways effective in really muddying the waters on what the term fake news is. For him, it's a story he doesn't like. It's media he doesn't like. And you're seeing people on the right and the left start to adopt this term where, you know, somebody on the right will call somebody on the left reporting fake news. And so the they term, said, it's, it's something that is said, just, people are, are using it for whatever purpose they want at that given moment. But and didn't I think, you unfortunately, play into that? it started to become almost meaningless. I, I mean, didn't BuzzFeed play into that by publishing that, well, dossier in inverted commas uh, about Trump and all the allegations supposedly gained uh, by, the, uh, by Russian intelligence? I mean, you printed stuff that you, you hadn't checked. Well, there's a big difference uh, and a big distinction in this. There's a difference between something that's 100% false that people put out there to fool people and a dossier that circulated at the highest levels of the government, that circulated among Washington press corps, that the intelligence officials in the United States briefed the president and the president-elect on, and that was then reported to exist and that briefing happened. That's a huge difference between something that somebody consciously makes up. And obviously that dossier was also compiled by a, a former Russia expert with MI6. So. But, you know, to your point, I think that there is a lot of confusion about these elements. Something that is completely false versus something that has unverified elements and claims that really haven't been proven yet. These are all part of the information environment that we're in. Some stuff is completely false. Some stuff is in that gray zone. Some things are true but are being torqued in certain ways. And I think it's very confusing for the average person to make their way through those things. Uh, Damien Collins, what, what has this got to do with Parliament? Why are you looking into it? Well, we were very interested that in the studies done looking at the presidential election in America, that the prominence and the level of sharing of the most popular fake news stories about the election was greater than the sharing of the most prominent stories that were actually true, that came from legitimate news organizations. So there's got to be a big concern for democracy if fake news is starting to crowd out real news and that people who are news consumers and sharers on sites like Facebook don't have the necessary tools to help them separate the fake from the non-fake. So, so you're looking at regulation, are you? Well, I think we're looking at a number of things. So sites like Facebook and Google already accept they have a social obligation to address pirated content online and illicit material. I think they have a social obligation as well towards the distribute, to act against the distribution of known sources of fake news. I think it'd also be interesting to look at whether you could have verifi verification tags, as Twitter have verifi verified users, where the companies check that someone is real and the person they claim to be. Could we have a way of verifying sources of news? So where a news organization or site is known not to produce fake news content, they get a kite mark to help direct and inform consumers that that's more likely to be a reliable source of information. Let, let me bring in um, Ella Whelan. What do you think of that as an idea to look at? Is it anything to do with them, for a start? Uh, well, I'm really quite angry about what my fellow panellists have said because what is being said here in the suggestion of regulation is essentially saying that the public can't be trusted to make their own minds about, about what is true and what is false in news. We are not trusted as members of the public to determine what's true and false. I mean, but if the evidence we... is the public don't know the difference, then maybe that's true. I don't think the evidence is that the public don't know the difference. The idea that, that fake news, um, and I mean, when we're talking about fake news that was in relation to Trump, it was ridiculous. And I think most people really did a double take when they read that Hillary Clinton was a paedophile or some of the other completely ridiculous claims that were made. This is no effect on democracy. What has an effect on democracy is elected members of parliament saying that they want the state to regulate the press. That's shocking. Paul Horn your experience is that a lot of people didn't know the difference between what was true and what was fake, isn't it? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the Trump supporters, uh, they ran with it. They loved it. They, uh, anything that fit their agenda, other stuff, um, they were called idiots. And uh, I think I got a lot of people not to vote for Trump. I think, um, in all honesty, I think any news media organization out there that uh, collects ad revenue and that tries to get uh, supporters in any way um, is fake news. Um, I think anything out there um, is some has some kind of fake news, uh, meaning um, they're trying to they're having an agenda. They put out news uh, specifically, um, just what the last panelists heard uh, or was saying, um, specifically uh, to get those uh, uh, viewers. Um, and I mean, you can look at the local news. The local news is the worst fake news. I mean, what do you see? I mean, at least in the States. I don't know how it is over in Europe. I mean, that's why I took this interview with Channel 4 News, just because you guys are a little more. But I mean, I, all I hear from you guys is negative stuff on Trump. I never hear any positive stuff on Trump. I mean, that's fake news right yeah. there. But well, you guys are way watch, better. Well, that's why I took more. this interview. But, uh, anyway, Craig, Craig Silverman, anyway me, real, real quick. What, no, real no, no, quick, no, no let, let me bring in Craig Silverman, because we don't have a lot of time. Craig okay. Silverman, is there any real difference between what they're doing in moral terms? Uh, you know, as, as Mr. Horner points out, you're all ultimately about getting ad revenue off the internet. Uh, you know, that's what really motivates you. You're a business, not a, not a public service. Well, uh, the business aspect is, is key here, and, and we should also point out that Paul earns his money from advertising on the internet as well. Uh, now, in terms of specific to BuzzFeed, we don't actually earn any money from the pages where our stories are. We do sponsor content. Not that that's a perfect model, but it's a different way where we don't get more money based on the number of clicks. But the financial incentive is a really important point here. It's one of the reasons why we saw a huge amount of fake news during the U.S. election, is okay. that people in the United States and elsewhere around the world saw that it was a business opportunity. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us tonight. Thank you. Sure. I've been getting